63. Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah chapter 63, we read a text that reads very similar to a text that we read in the book of Revelation, where the prophet here, Isaiah, is asking questions, if you will, by inspiration, and then God responds. And there's a lot of highly figurative language here in this chapter that we want to examine and look at as we uh, consider the nature of God as presented here in this particular text. We'll begin in verse 1, chapter 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have treaden... I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help me, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord, and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed upon us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed upon us, uh, upon them according to his mercy and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people. Children that will not lie, so he was their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled. They vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and be fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble? As a beast goeth down in the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest, so didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and behold, From the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me, are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, though, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways, and hardened our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake the tribes of thine inheritance. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. So in the first six verses, we read that communication where the prophet asks a question uh, figuratively and God responds. Then in verses 7 through verse 14, the prophet reminds the people of God's goodness, his glory, his mercy, how he saved them. In in particular, a reference back to the days when God, through his prophet Moses, led them out of Egypt and out of captivity and saved them from their uh, captivity, their, their captor, and saved them on the other side. He reminds them of this good glorious Savior, and then a a prayer of penance, if you will. The the prophet asks God to forgive them 
for their sins and for their error. Recognizing that what God did in the first six verses to his enemies could happen to anyone who becomes an enemy of God. As we talked about in our Bible class this morning, anyone who stands in God's way. And so the prophet asked for forgiveness. So we begin looking at that question and response in verse 1 through verse 6. And we see that uh, we have a question here asked. The prophet says, who is this individual that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This, this, is, uh, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. So Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah speaks in this question of seeing a glorious, majestic, dressed individual coming out of Edom, which would have been south of Judah, south of Israel. Edom being a people related to Israel, uh, but having conflict with Israel from the very beginning, uh, standing in the way of people of God's people from a long time back. And so we read of this majestic figure dressed in majestic clothing, majestic raiment, purple, you might say, the, uh, the, the clothing of a king coming out of Edom. Glorious in his apparel, strong as if he had just won a victory. And I think that's the picture we're about to see. So then the answer there in the beginning, at the end of verse 1 is, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So this is God. This is a picture of God riding victoriously in his majestic kingly apparel out of Edom and into Israel. And he says, I am the righteous one. I am the one that develops a righteousness that is I determine what right is and what wrong is I am the one who is mighty to save but not only is he the one who makes the plan by which one can be righteous he and the one that is mighty to save the next question lets us know that he alone is the one that can determine if individuals are right with his plan and worthy of salvation the, the prophets asked the question, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? There was a stain upon this kingly apparel as he got closer to Isaiah. Isaiah could see that though he was majestically dressed as a, as a victor, uh, as a king in his royal attire, it was stained. And it was stained red. It says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? So, as those who would uh, tread grapes and uh, perhaps get some of the grape stain on the hem of their garment, because they might use their feet to press down the grapes to get the juice out, it, uh, the grape juice would stain the bottom of their garment. So it looked as if he had been walking through a wine press, a grape juice press and had uh, stained the bottom of his garment as it was red. And so that's the title of my lesson. Why are, you, why are your garments red? <laughs> why are your garments red? Because I think the rest of this passage, and as we connect that idea of that stained color of red, it applies to our lives today. So verse 3 is the response. I have trodden down the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. So here God speaking says this stain is the blood of the enemies of Israel, the enemies of God as if he had brought vengeance upon those individuals who had disobeyed him. He had become victorious over those who had stood in his way. And so his hem of his garment was red with blood, figuratively speaking, to point out that he had destroyed his enemy, that his enemies would not stand in his way that the enemies of Israel, that the enemies of God's people, that the enemies of God would be destroyed. A warning to all those individuals who would seek to disobey God, that they would not stand faithful in his sight. That though he was 
the one who developed righteousness and the one who was mighty to save, he could only save those individuals who would choose to be so. That those who would not be saved, that those who would not be right in his sight, that, that those who would not be obedient would be trodden down like those grapes. They would be squashed. They would be destroyed. A stark warning to the enemies of God and their future. Notice verse 4, he says, For the day of vengeance is in mine heart. God isn't one who wants destruction. He's not interested in individuals falling or being destroyed. But his long-suffering nature runs out. His offer of grace, his offer of mercy has been offered to all those people, even to those who would be his enemies. But if they do not accept it, if they, do, if they reject his mercy, if they reject his grace, their final result is doom. And so he is the one that brings about the plan of righteousness, how these individuals could avoid the punishment of being an enemy of God and be right with him and be a friend of God but time runs out. There's a day of vengeance coming when he will not be long-suffering anymore. The year of my redeemed is come. So in verse 4, we see that there cannot be a redeeming or a salvation without a destruction. Redeeming, salvation requires the destruction of evil, the destruction of sin. Thus, the reminder in the next particular part of the passage, verse 7 through verse 14, were a, a reminder of the days when Moses brought their ancestors out of Egypt. Those individuals who followed Moses, those individuals who followed God across the dry land, landed on the other side of the sea, and they turned and watched as their enemy was destroyed. Egypt was washed away that day, and they were saved from their enemy. In saving Israel, there was a destruction of that which held them back. In order for Israel to be saved that day, there had to be a destruction of the captor. In reference to that, we see that Egypt is a type or a figure of how sin holds people away from God, separates people from God. In Isaiah chapter 59, just a few chapters before, verse 1 and verse 2, Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Verse uh, Chapter 63 tells us that He is the Savior. He is the victor. He is the Redeemer. It's not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. One has to separate himself from the captor, the sin, that which separates him from God. When Moses and Israel crossed the Red Sea, they were saved from their past captor. But to be saved from their past captor, that captor, the sin, had to be washed away. It had to be destroyed. God is the one that can do that. God is the decider. He decides. He judges who is right and who is wrong. And to those who are against him, a stark warning. For the day of vengeance is in mine hand. Verse 4. Verse 5, he says, I looked and there was none to help. There's nobody but God who can determine how evil sin is, who can determine what sin and righteousness is to distinguish the two. And so if we are going to be right and not wrong, we have to seek God. He is the only one that can determine those things. Similarly, it is only God who could determine what the remedy for that sin was. He, he determined the remedy in the days of Moses, that Egypt and their armies would be destroyed in the Red Sea. 
Today he determined that it was his only son and the blood that was necessary to wash away sin to be shed on the cross that would take away sin. Only God, no one with him, could determine. He was the only one that could determine that nature of sin and righteousness. And so he says, it was my own arm that brought salvation and my fury, it upheld me. In verse 1 through verse 6, we see the King, the Almighty, draped in glorious kingly attire. But where, why is his garment red? Why is he, his clothes red? Because he can't associate himself with sin. He can't associate himself with evil. And as long-suffering as God is and as desirous as he is that all men come to him and be saved, he is the Redeemer. He is the one who brings righteousness and salvation. There is a day in which a judgment, a vengeance will take place. Those who are against God's people, those who are against God, will endure the wrath of God as pictured by the red clothes or the red stain at the bottom of the king's apparel. In Isaiah chapter 34, Isaiah chapter 34, the prophet is giving warning to those who are enemies of God. Warning them that the mercy of God would run out one day. He says, come near, verse 1, ye nations, to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nation, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to their slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcass. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall, upon, uh, fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea or Edom and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. To be an opponent of God is to be in the pathway of destruction. And so Isaiah 63 and Isaiah 34 show us that figurative idea or that figurative concept of how God will not just defend his people and save his people from their enemies, but how the destruction of their enemies will take place. It is because, not because they are not necessarily his chosen people. Individuals didn't have to be a part of Israel in order to uh, avoid the wrath of God. The Bible tells us that the Gentiles had a law unto themselves. Jonah went to Nineveh and he didn't tell them to become Israelites. He told them to repent. He told them to repent and turn to the Lord. And so it wasn't their nationality that God was interested in. It was in their obedience. The punishment was for the disobedience. In Joel 3... Joel chapter 3, verses 12 and verse 13. Joel says, let the heathen be wakened, wake up, <laughs> and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. 
Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Once again, it was their sin that separated them from God. It wasn't about their nationality. It was about their wickedness. These individuals had come before God, and once again, a, a picture of God coming through and pressing the vine, right? And he said their wickedness overflowed. Their wickedness was great. Therefore, there was a lot of red stain at the bottom of his garment because he was trampling it out. He was troddening down the grape or the sin. It was the wickedness of, their, uh, of the people that led to their destruction. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, the Bible tells us that we need to behold both the goodness and severity of God. The goodness upon those that believe and obey, but the severity upon those who either do not believe or at one time believe and fall away. And so we know that God redeems those who are faithful to him. God is the arm of salvation, but God is also the arm of destruction. He is the arm of of doom to those who would not obey to him, be obedient to him. As I mentioned, there's a lot of figurative language here that is, is similar to Revelation, and I want to go to Revelation. We see here the picture of the red or the blood being that of a reference to the, to the wickedness of the people that led to their destruction. But in Revelation 19, we read that there was another blood. A blood that was shed in order to forgive. A blood that was shed in order to overcome that wickedness. In Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, John, by revelation, says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His garments, too, were bloody. His name is called the Word of God. This here a reference to Jesus, John chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 14. Jesus was the Word incarnate, made flesh. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They were not stained. The enemies of God stained, right? As if God had trampled down on them, and the blood was a reference to their destruction, that which separated them from God, their wickedness. But here, individuals in heaven who followed Jesus are clean. Their clothes white. And out of his mouth, this is the Lord, goeth a sharp sword, similar to what we read in Isaiah 63. That which it sh he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The Savior, the Redeemer, but also the one who brings justice to those who are wicked. And so we see two pictures of blood. The one who was trampling, the one who was destroying because of the separation, the blood worn by those individuals, a reference to their wickedness, their deceit, their disobedience, their hatred towards God, and those who had no stain on their garment. They were white. They were clean. Verse 16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so in verse 13, we find that the Lord clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name being the Word of God. A reference here to the blood that was shed on the cross. 
This was his own blood. It wasn't the blood uh, of those that were receiving the reckoning, the judgment. This was the blood that he shed on the cross that was necessary for individuals to have their robes white and clean. In Revelation 7, we read of the washing of the robes, the washing of the linens, the washing of the, the clothing. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Not dripped in blood, not stained with blood, the wickedness of mankind. And one of the elders answered, saying, uh, or verse 14, he said, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The red blood that was shed by Jesus, necessary for us to get clean, to get holy, to be seen as washed. And so we see this now contrast of the red stain, the red blood of the Lord whose vesh, whose clothing was dipped in the blood, his own, only he could shed the blood that was necessary to wash away sin. Just as God in Isaiah 6 or 3 was the only one that could destroy sin, separate the redeemed from those who were disobedient to God. In Revelation 1 verse 5, we connect the red of the blood and the white of the robes, the cleaning and the washing, with an act of obedience that all individuals who are Christians today have participated in. In order to contact that red blood that was shed for the sins of the world, the wickedness, in order that their robes not be red or stained with sin. In Revelation 1, verse 5, G, uh, John says, From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How do we get our sins washed away so that we have a white robe, a clean robe, a robe that is not going to see destruction, a robe, one who is... Uh, wearing the clothing of righteousness, not the clothing of disobedience. As Paul recounts his conversion, he uses this connection of washing away of sins in Acts 22, verse 16. Acts 22, verse 16. Paul, re 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 regaling his conversion, says that he was asked by Ananias, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, notice, and wash away thy sins. Individuals today are seen as clean and holy and white when they obey God, which culminates in water baptism. When individuals who read and study the Bible Develop faith, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith that leads them to act and repent of their sins, Luke 13, verse 3. Recognizing that it is their sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. He was dying on that cross to shed the blood that was necessary to wash away sin. To confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as the Ethiopian eunuch. And then to be baptized in water, to be added to the Lord's church, Acts 2, verse 38 through verse 47, to be saved from their past sins, to be forgiven of their past sins, Acts 2, verse 38, and to have their sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16, and Revelation 1, verse 5. To those who are enemies of God, they will be not victorious, but trampled down. That's why we see the red on the garment of God in Isaiah, in Isaiah 63. But to those today in the Christian age who will hear the word of God and believe it, their garments can be white because of the blood that Jesus shed. The blood of forgiveness. 
those individuals who obey and have their sins washed away will have the robes that are white and clean, holy, and they are they who are with God in heaven. We'll finish back in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Where God, through his prophet Isaiah, begs, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, red, that which separates us from God, that which will be destroyed when God tramples out the wickedness, Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We see two pictures of the blood, the blood of wickedness and the blood of forgiveness. If we will hear the word of God and believe it and obey it, we can have our sins washed away to be seen as white, to be on God's side. But we need not forget the wickedness, the hate the deceit that will be destroyed. When God saves his people, those who are against God will be destroyed. And so we live today a life of faithfulness in order to be right with God so that we do not endure that fate of destruction, but that we endure to the end to receive the crown of life, Revelation 2 verse 10. If you are here and need to obey the invitation, it is extended We'll be happy to assist you to obey the gospel and become a Christian. If you've, not, if you've already obeyed the gospel but have some other need, we're here to assist you as well as we stand and sing.